Hi everyone, you wouldn't guess it, but I'm here at Stanford at the Hot Chips conference. Why am I at Hot Chips? Because Hot Chips is an amazing conference and you should all attend. Why am I here? Well, one of the topics that's been pervasive throughout this conference is the use of vector extensions. Now, we could be talking ARM or x86. There's just a common thread through a lot of the presentations here. But because I'm on site with the fabulous chips and cheese duo of chips and cheese, or clam and cheese, we're going to start speaking about AVX10 and the next generation of vector instructions for x86 and Intel. Stay tuned. But first, a word from our sponsor. A lot of the content on this channel wouldn't be possible without you, the supporters. Many thanks to all who support. And you, if you're interested in supporting, then we have Patreon, we have a merch store, I have a Substack newsletter, or simply just like and subscribe. It really does help out the channel. So to start, what is AVX? AVX stands for Advanced Vector I Extensions. What are they used for? Well, sometimes rather than going through a bunch of numbers and doing the same math sequentially, you want to apply the same operation to a whole bunch of numbers, like a vector of numbers. So with AVX, the, the idea is that you just do a bunch of math to a series of instructions. Now, sometimes that's adds, that's multiplies, sometimes that's uh, bit swizzles and things like scatter gather operations. The, uh, the instructions that these things can do is incredibly complex. And as a result, we've had multiple generations of AVX in the industry, especially with x86. So first of all, we had AVX. This was first introduced way, way, way back, if I remember correctly, Sandy Bridge. And then we had the second generation of AVX, which expanded to essentially more different operations uh, to work on lots of different types of numbers. That was more in the sort of Haswell, I think. So we're talking about uh, Intel Core fourth gen there. Now we've had AVX 512, which is essentially the third generation of AVX. This specifically is working on 512 bit vectors. So you can have so many 64-bit numbers, so many 32-bit numbers. This required its own dedicated silicon and became kind of massive when it was first introduced with the Enterprise Skylake silicon. Since then, we've seen on all Enterprise silicon to date. Intel kind of dabbled with it in the consumer space and then uh, had it and disabled it and then completely removed it. But one of the difficulty of these uh, new uh, extensions, these new instructions, is adoption. The easiest way for adoption is if everybody has access to it. And Intel just couldn't find a way to make sure that both consumers and the enterprise crowd had access to AVX 512. On top of that, AVX 12 uh, went through a rough birth because every new generation added more instructions to AVX 512, just making it incredibly complex. And if I can find it, I'll show this int latex diagram where it just shows just how many flavors of AVX 512 there are. And so a few weeks ago, Intel released a paper on something called AVX 10. Well, hang on, we just had 512 and now it's 10. This is why I want to bring the chips and cheese guys in. So you ready, guys? Yep. So to my left here. We have Chester Lamb, also known as Clam Chowder, uh, online. And then George, you may remember George from uh, x86s, uh, Intel's Fred video. These guys have also appeared on the channel when discussing the Tachyum AI architecture. Tachyum, because it's tacky. So let, 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 let's start with you, Chester. Why is this called 10 when we've just had AVX 512? Is this Microsoft naming? No, uh, even though I do actually work for Microsoft from a day job. But we actually don't really know why exactly it's called 10. Uh, one theory is that AVX 512 is actually more accurately named AVX 3. And as Intel started iterating on AVX 512, adding different instructions, adding vFlow 16 support, and so on, all those versions, if you started incrementing AVX from 3, 4, 5, 6, well, now we end up with 10 here. So how, how prevalent has AVX 512 been in code bases? It really depends on where you look. So there are applications like FFmpeg, well, not FFmpeg, but rather LibX264, for example, SVTAV1, although that's from Intel. And these applications that benefit a lot from being able to process more data with fewer instructions and a very regular patterns that lend themselves to vectorization, that's where you're going to find AVX 512. Outside, in like, if you're just running a web browser, if you're just running regular code, AVX 512 use, if any of it, is going to be restricted to stuff like memory copies. Maybe if you happen to cop call into a library routine and they use that to simply move data, not do computation. But AMD just introduced AVX 512 as well. Yes, because they're looking to do exactly the same thing with applications that do benefit from it. So if you do run those AVX 512 stuff, if you want a ride cruncher, if you do a lot of video encoding, if you're, well, if you're an HVC, 
then that's going to help you. So, George, to you, AVX10, what exactly is it? Well, it, for all intents and purposes, what it's doing is it's coagulating all the different flavors of AVX512 into just one simple ISA CPU ID for all intents and purposes. And what it's also doing is it's taking all those nice new instructions for 512-bit operations and it's bringing them down to 256-bit and 128-bit operations as well. So that is stuff like masking, new swizzle operations, and a whole bunch of new um, data types as well, such as FP16 and BF16. Uh, I remember that when it was when all these AVX512 instructions came out, a lot of people really enjoyed them, but were annoyed the fact it was limited to these such large vector widths. So now it's kind of bringing everything down to okay, the lowest common denominator. Yes, um, it is bringing it down sort of to that. 256-bit instruction level, which if if you've been keeping up with uh, Intel CPUs, that's important for their consumer lines and Alder Lake and Raptor Lake because their Gracemont or E-cores are only 256-bit AVX, not 512-bit. AVX10, I mean, I've kind of looked at the spec and they've got a nice diagram. We'll show the diagram on screen. They've got this 10.1 and 10.2. So it's going to be an evolving thing. So 10.1 is sort of the preliminary spec. 10.2 is really where it all sort of comes together and becomes this nice sort of single ISA of just, hey, hey, I have AVX10.2 support to the OS and to all your programs. And potentially Intel can iterate that with 10.3, 10.4, 10.5, so on and so forth. AVX 360, AVX 1. <laughs> it's, uh, so who is, this go, who is this going to matter most to? So a big sort of group of people that this will matter to is the compiler devs. The people who are writing all the compiler code and trying to optimize the best for the CPUs because in Alder Lake, while you had cores that in theory could run 512-bit operations, they had to be fused off for simplicity. You Doing heterogeneous ISA is very, very difficult. So with AVX10, what that allows compiler devs to do is to optimize for essentially, like you said, the lowest common denominator. And you still get all those lovely, lovely instructions. And something that people gloss over is that it's not necessarily 512-bit that's the most important about AVX 512. It's actually all the new operations. That's really the big thing there. And that's something that's commonly overlooked. And it's an easy, easy mistake to make. So this, this will be applicable on both P cores and E cores in the future? Yes. So... Chester, with your with your testing, because I know you like to run the sort of lovely micro benchmarks that we all do. Um, with this announcement, how are you planning how your testing is going forward? Well, as for me, I'll have to detect AVX 10.2 or whatever support, and then I'll have to write tests for that. And one interesting thing is that now there are three possible vector links you can discover through the CPU ID extension for it. You can have 128-bit, 256-bit, uh, and 512 bit so I'll probably have to write flavors of the test that deal with all three. So you can't just write one unified instruction and it will just apply based on the vector length of the processor? No, that would be difficult. And besides, I would want to know, hey, like, is this actually splitting 256-bit operations into two 128-bit ones, even if it's advertising like 256-bit? Yeah, because the situation I was describing, for those that don't know, is more like scalable vector extensions. Where yeah, so this is actually uh, very unlike SVE in that there are three vector links, whereas SVE goes all the way up to like 248-bit. And SVE also lets you tell the ISA what specific vector length you want. So for example, the ISA could support 512-bit, but you say, I want these vectors to be 256-bit because I am trying to do vector length agnostic code and I am incrementing by 256 bits every time. Well, as far as I know, you can't do that with AVX10. You can simply discover what vector length it does support, and that's it. So when are we expecting the first generation of AVX10 to hit the market? Oh, gosh, whenever Intel decides to roll this thing into your e-cores, because that's what this is really all about. Evidently, Intel has decided that it's too expensive to support 512-bit vectors in their small cores, and this is what we have. 
So, I mean, in, in my mind, it's the Granite Rapid Sierra Forest platform where, say, 10.1 is coming in and then 10.2 later. Yes. But, but, but your, your, your last point just gave me this really interesting thought. Will Intel ever make a CPU with a 512-bit native vector length again, given the pain they've had to go through? Well, on the consumer side, it seems unlikely because if they decided, hey, we can actually make a cheap AVX 512 implementation with like Gracemont, then they wouldn't have done this at all. All they would have done is, hey, we're going to roll this out next generation, done. But since they've gone with this, it's a bit like the Spectre vulnerabilities. They have said, okay, these CPUs are vulnerable and we're not going to fix it. Same with this. We are probably not going to support AVX 512 at the 512 bit vector length for the foreseeable future on these little cores. Is this really just complicating things? To an extent, yes. So people writing assembly code or using intrinsics will have to potentially write different versions of code for each vector length. So they might have to write a 512-bit version. They might have to write a 256-bit version. And then if the 128-bit 12, version ever comes out, which Intel has said they have no plans for, but if it ever does happen, then they'll have to look at that too if they want to take advantage of these features. Is that something you can do with preprocessor commands? Depends on how smart the compiler is. You could potentially have a maybe an OpenMP style like Pragma, like parallelize this. I have all these constraints satisfied. And then maybe the compiler can go dump out 256 bit code, 512 bit code, and so on. That would be ideal. But in a lot of cases, the compiler can't do that. And that's why if you go to the source repositories for all kinds of projects, you will see handwritten assembly or intrinsics. So George, how well has Intel communicated all of this, do you think? It's, it's been a bit of a bear to some degree. Like the communication has been kind of... Patchy? Yeah, I think <laughs> that's the best word is patchy. Um, and trying to explain all this, while difficult is something that has been a bit lackluster from Intel side, um, at least for the average consumer. Um, it's been very confusing. AVX2, AVX512, what is AVX10? What is all this? And so I think that something that could be improved is the sort of explaining what all this is to your average person. So one of the major critiques for AVX512, at least with the first couple of generations, was that if you ever implemented instructions, it would cause your CPU to get very hot, and it would cause declocking of your cores and performance, and that's why it wasn't used that much. That obviously improves with all this? So, no. Um, well, yes and no. So, it, if you look at the slides from this very hot chips from AMD on their Zen 4 core, they actually saw performance improvement and frequency improvement with their AVX512 implementation. So... No. So can you just go over what that is? So the way that AMD implemented AVX 512 was splitting the 512 ops at the instruction execution unit level. So you're not taking up register or um, scheduler um, space, but uh, it is still executing those 512-bit um, operations over two cycles from the execution unit's perspective. So, so with Intel, you said it is kind of better with thermals, but not. So that's because Intel has two 512-bit uh, execution units. Um, so in that case, yes, you can see a performance decrease and clock speed decrease from using 512-bit operations. Just small 512-bit operations. E one-offs. E yes. Uh, so if you're just doing one-offs in mostly memory stuff, then that's what's called 512 lite. Right. And that doesn't really declock. In most modern Intel CPUs, I'm looking at Sapphire Rapids and Ice Lake. Even with heavier AVX 512, yes, there is still a clock decrease, but it's, it's nowhere near where it was with the introductory core Skylake X which very much did suffer from clock speed decreases while writing heavy AVX code. So 
Chester, if you were to request one thing out of all of this from Intel, what would it be? Oh boy, uh, I know this is never going to happen, but for the people working on GraceMod, if you could roll out a minimal effort or minimal die area AVX 512 implementation and just unify it all with a 512-bit vector length, you can make it cheap. You can make it like center CNS, where you've literally aliased the mass registers to the integer register file, and you are cracking 512-bit ops in two. Even if you did that, that would make it so much easier for everyone writing code. Your adoption would be so much better. And instead of doing AVX 10, right out the gate, you will be able to take advantage of all the AVX 512 code out there. So there you have it. Thanks to these guys for coming on yet another video. If you don't know who they are, go visit chipsandcheese.com. If you really loved the Enantec deep dives into microarchitecture that I used to do, now it's these guys who are doing it. So go check them out. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.